Um, so let's get started. Thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Seth Rubin. I'm a, a professor in chemistry and biochemistry and the faculty undergraduate program director. Um, we uh, decided to organize this as a session to get information out about grad school. Some of you are thinking about it. And um, so just a couple of people to introduce a lot of you um, probably have met Marla. Hi, friend. <laughs> Uh, and uh, um, uh, Tim Johnston's also here, and we have um, our uh, undergrads panel um, that we're going to hear from in a little bit. So the um, the goal um, I want to talk a little bit at the beginning about just kind of why go to grad school. Um, in, in case you haven't made up your mind or just want to know kind of what it's all about, um, and and Tim for sure can help me with that. Um, I have a bunch of slides put together that kind of go through a little bit more than nuts and bolts about the process. So what the application process is like with kind of like rough timelines and um, what's required of you. Um, and um, kind of a little bit about maybe how you choose a program, what you should be thinking about, and, and we can definitely hear from the panel on that. And then um, I'll introduce, um, let the, the um, panel come up and they'll each take like maybe five minutes just to kind of tell you about their experience this year, um, applying to grad school, getting in about their decision-making process. Uh, and then I definitely want to leave um, a bunch of time for just answer your questions. And I can do that with um, everybody's help. Um, okay, so yeah. Um, so who already knows for sure they're gonna go to grad school? Okay. <laughs> for sure, like this for sure. <laughs> okay, or half answer. Okay, so nobody's really sure. But thinking about it is great. Um, so, and and when I think when I use the term grad school, usually I'm thinking about PhD program in let's say chemistry, biochemistry, molecular biology, material science, kind of like the chemistry, biochemistry related fields. It's kind of what we're talking about. Um, and and I mean PhD. Um, there's also programs where you get a master's, and we can talk a little bit about that. Um, uh, it's um, quite a bit different. Uh, and kind of what you do with that degree is quite a bit different, the meaning of that degree. So, um, but if, if you want to talk about that at the end, I'm happy um, to, to, to spend some time on it. But kind of the focus, at least what I had in mind was to talk about um, getting a PhD. Um, so, so why get a PhD? Kind of what's the point of, of PhD education in the sciences? Um, the way that I um, think about it, and it very much relates to the way I think about what kind of job you can get with a bachelor's versus what type of job you can get when you have a PhD. It's kind of similar. When you graduate your bachelor's, where you all are now and where we were when we graduated our bachelor's, I would say, I remember thinking about myself, I could probably go into a lab and perform an experiment that was kind of described to me. Um, and so I knew, like, had some techniques, some laboratory technique that I learned, and I had some kind of fundamental framework of the science where I could kind of understand what I was doing and what the point was and could ask questions or read more and learn about it, right? But that, that idea of, like, performing an experiment versus what I would call designing the experiment um, or even figuring out what experiment to do or even, like, what the hypothesis is or what the question is that you're trying to address. So being able to come up with an interesting question to study and designing an experimental framework to answer that question is something that I certainly didn't think I could do as a bachelor's um, uh, to a large extent. And that is what I would describe um, what you learn to do as a PhD and what you do with a PhD in your job, right? So it's more like coming up with the questions, coming up with the models, the hypotheses, and designing how to test them, as opposed to people who work in, let's say, industry with a bachelor's degree, um, especially until you get a lot of experience, in large part what you're doing is performing experiments. Um, and, and that's kind of, I would say, the key difference. I don't know if you want to add anything. I was like, that's just an excellent way of framing it. Um, the, the notion of contrast in the performing versus designing. Um, I think that that actually sums it up really, really nicely. You don't have to, but as Seth Rollins like said, you talk about, a lot of times you'll end up in more of like a potentially supervisory or managerial role, like you're designing, you're directing, um, as opposed to explicitly just performing. 
Um, but lots of different variations. There are lots of PhD scientists that still operate at the bench. There are people that are non PhD scientists that go into more managerial positions. Yeah, there's lots of people who go into industry with a bachelor's degree and just after enough time and experience kind of work your way up to you know what we're doing what PhD scientists do. So it is possible. But um, the more common route is to, to get that training and experience as a bench. So um, yeah, so that's why you would want to go. Um, we could talk a little bit about the decision to go right after um, getting your bachelor's degree or not, um, or doing what people kind of call gap years. Or, um, there's lots of pros and cons to both. Um, it kind of depends also on your individual situ um, situation and um, how much research you've been able to do while you were here, um, how informed you feel about your decision, all those things. Maybe we should come back, um, actually, that maybe towards the end once we've kind of talked about the, that, the admissions process and kind of what the criteria are. And that conversation might be better then. But don't let me forget, that that's a good thing to talk about because I think um, that's, in addition to making the decision to go, making the decision when to go is, is also a really uh, important one as well. Um, okay, so um, I guess let's start um, with a little bit of the timeline just to give it all kind of the framework. Um, so um, this would be assuming you're gonna start in um, the fall. Right, so um, so these these guys who are starting, I think this fall, or maybe some of you are taking a gap year. I think you're all starting this fall. Um, they did this right this past year, so it's it's kind of like a year in advance, right? So if you're thinking I'm graduating in uh, let's see, it'd be spring 2025, and so you want to start grad school in fall 2025, you would apply December 2024, right? So this is December before the fall that you would matriculate um, is what we're talking about here. And that's usually when the application deadline. They like seem to keep <laughs> creeping up and up and up. I remember it used to be like January 15th and then it was January 1st. And then now it's like a lot of them are December 1st. So I think ours is December 1st now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I know like all the schools like feel like if they get it done earlier, they can like get the students to want to come. Um, so it's sort of like this competitive race to be earlier and earlier. Um, but now it's like yeah, right after Thanksgiving. So you definitely like um, you're going to be last year, next year, you're thinking about it for the year after. In the fall, you're really going to want to start getting your application materials together um, and get ready to apply in December. It's a little bit different for master's programs. They tend to um, not do it until later in the spring. Um, so uh, if that's your route, there's a little bit of more time. But PhD programs, um, it's, it's pretty early in the year. Um, OK. So the process is you would apply, um, let's say, like December 1st or December 15th. Usually there's a pretty quick turnaround, and um, uh, places that are interested in you will give you an offer to uh, come and interview. Uh, since COVID, there's kind of become different flavors of that. Some schools now are actually only, they started doing remote interviewing during COVID, and they kind of liked it. So some of the interviews first will give you a, um, a remote like Zoom interview, and then maybe as a second step, they'll invite you to come in person. Um, some places like uh, we're still just doing now uh, we've returned to in-person in interviews, so it kind of depends. Um, but those interviews um, usually take place uh, either late December, especially if it's a, a Zoom one might be then, or maybe in January, maybe into early February. But it's going to be kind of that winter um, time period where you'll do the interview. And I'm pretty sure everywhere PhD program is going to have some kind of interview process. Um, so that's a little bit different than college admissions where interviews are optional, interviews are um, required. And, and we'll talk more about the interview, um, but you can think of it as also a two-way interview. It's, it's, it's not only um, their chance to get to know you better and make a decision about admissions, but it's your chance to get to know the program that you might be going to uh, as well. So that's a really important part of the process. Um, uh, yeah, and then interviews will take place. So the inter uh, either some of them now are in January, um, mm -hmm. as everything's moving up, I think ours is in January. Um, some of them might go until March, and then usually the decision deadline is sometime in April. So most of like all the UCs, it's like April fifteenth, um, and then um, you'll you'll let one know that where you're going that you're going to go there. Um, so that's kind of um, the timeline. Um, okay, uh, what is the application? What are they asking for? And and what makes uh, you be a strong applicant? Um, one of the most important things is academic performance, right? Your grades, grades are important, uh, especially in your STEM classes. 
Um, so that's something you want to think about. Um, the other um, really important thing uh, is research experience. So how many people are have some kind of research experience doing research? Okay. Yeah, if um, if you don't have research experience and you're thinking about graduate school, um, that's definitely something you want to get involved with as soon as you can. Um, that could be one of the top reasons um, why you would maybe want to delay applying to grad school and going right after you graduate is to get more research experience. That's probably the most common reason to take a gap year is to spend that gap year getting research experience. Um, but there's there's lots of ways to get involved in research on campus if you're not, and we do a whole workshop like this in the fall um, to come back to, or Marla probably has recordings um, that she could send you. Um, and, and I'm always happy, um, or Tim, um, to talk about uh, how to get involved in research. But it's really important, and um, it's important for uh, the admissions committee to evaluate your potential uh, as a graduate student. But it's also really important for you to know if you want to go to grad school at all. Um, and um, so, yeah, but you, you have to know what you're getting into. Um, PhD uh, programs, you take some classes, but really, you know, 90% um, of your time you spend doing research. And that's the goal, right, is to become a research scientist. So it's kind of um, you, you need some research experience for yourself to know it's for you. Um, and you need it to develop skills and the process of thinking like a scientist um, so that you hit the ground running when you get to graduate school. Um, so that's probably uh, just as important as grades. Um, every, every application is going to require uh, one, two, maybe three written statements. Probably the most common these days um, is uh, two types of statements. One that's called the statement of purpose, um, which is uh, more kind of uh, what are your goals, like your career goals? What are your interests in terms of science? Uh, and what's your preparation? Um, most of that, or a chunk of that, is going to be describing your research experience. That's um, that's probably the number one thing that admissions committees want to read about. And in addition to kind of what your interests are going to be, um, but, but what experience have you had that's prepared you uh, and motivated those interests? Um, so that's where you're going to talk about your research experience. Uh, and then the other um, statement is the personal history statement. That's where you can talk about um, who you are. Um, again, kind of like motivation could be in there, what unique experiences um, you bring, and what kind of you're going to bring to that cohort of students um, that you're going to be a part of. That's where you would, you would put that. And this is also the place where if you um, face barriers, um, you might want to bring that up um, if it's important to shaping who you are and um, how you've done. Um, you, would, you would bring that up in the personal history statement as well. Um, okay, and then the fourth important part of the application uh, are reference letters. Usually you need three, maybe four reference letters. Um, definitely one of those letters is going to be um, from somebody you've done research with, so a research advisor. Uh, and then usually it would be, you know, maybe a professor that you've had a lot of contact with. Um, and um, and uh, and yeah, somebody, uh, maybe you had an internship or some other context where you, where somebody could write a letter for you, but you definitely want to choose people um, who know you well um, and, and can kind of comment specifically on things you've done that show you're going to be a good candidate for grad school. Um, okay, uh, maybe a little bit less important. Um, uh, well, one point that I wanted to make um, is that you don't necessarily have to be uh, trained specifically in the area where you want to go get a PhD. In other words, like um, you could go get a PhD in a molecular biology program, even if your degree maybe is in chemistry. Um, as long as you've kind of taken some classes and maybe your research experience is more molecular biology, but as long as you bring some preparation within a related field, uh, admissions committees aren't going to look down too much on that because um, it's kind of a normal thing that you get your bachelor's and then you might realize, oh, actually, I'm more interested in this other area. But um, there's not this like one to one correspondence, like only a chemistry major can apply for a chemistry PhD and only a marine biologist can apply for a marine biology PhD. Um, you can, you know, major in biology and apply for a marine biology PhD. So I just want you to not feel like you have to switch majors or feel like you're boxed into any particular path. But um, in our chemistry and biochemistry applications, we definitely get people that have majored in like all kinds of different things. Um, even more true when people take gap years and they're, they're interested. 
Uh, and then the other thing that's maybe less important, uh, but definitely you want to at least explore like web pages and applications to see if required are um, GREs. Um, they've kind of been wavering, same with SAT now, whether or not um, it's required. Some um, programs require them, some don't. Um, but I don't want you to like freak out and think, oh, there's no way I could go to grad school because I don't want to take a GRE or I'm not going to do well in a GRE. Or, um, it's definitely, I would say, compared to these things, something that's probably in PhD admissions weighed a little bit less these days. Thoughts and comments? Yeah, I just wondered if I could just weigh in on the, the maybe less important topic one. Um, one aspect of that is something that I always like to tell applicants is whether it's your major or whether it's your past research experience. So yeah, exactly like Seth said, not to feel boxed in by it or restricted by it. It's always something enabled. Um, it, whether it's that you, if you did it and you like it and you realize that you want to keep doing it, that's fine. But it's also okay to have had a research experience and realize I don't really want to do this anymore. That you want to do something else. Um, you can't. It's not that you're only allowed to demonstrate interest in labs that have done things similar to what you've done before. Like it is okay to, to branch out. From that. One thing that I would say is if you're planning on making a, a change, whether it's in a field or from your past research experiences. You do want to make sure that you're very clearly stating how the experiences that you have had will allow you to kind of move in the new area that you want or move the new direction that you want to move in. Um, because every past experience that you've had can productively contribute to that forward motion. And you want to make sure that they know that you know that. Um, so, so you do want to make sure to, to mention that the bigger the change is, the more it does kind of behoove you to make that explicitly clear. Um, another thing is if your long-term interest is in something very distinct from what anybody in that department works on, as far as I'm concerned, there's not, no problem with that, but make sure that they know, that you know, that you're okay with not doing that in the end. To make that a little bit more concrete, you might be like, I want to study origin of life science. So I'm going to apply to UCSC, and at this point in time, our chemistry department does not have anybody that does origin of life research. So somebody reading that application might be like, well, they clearly didn't really look at our website very much or actually check out our faculty. They wouldn't be able to do that. If you say, I want to do origin of life research, I realize there's nobody that does that there right now, but there are many people there that do things I'm interested in, and I'd be able to get the training that I could then use to subsequently pursue origin of life research. That's now a compelling argument that you're making. Um, so just one thing on that, that may be less important point number two. Yeah. Um, and while I'm on my soapbox, I'm going to say something about the most important part too, uh, the, the most important part to the application is like anytime, I would argue anytime you're interfacing with anybody in life, uh, like empathy is always a good thing to sort of practice. Um, so put yourself in the shoes of the person that's reading your application. Like you're trying to convince them to give you a position in this program. If you were to read your application through that lens, every aspect of it should be serving some function, whether it's your academic performance, like, hey, like, you want me to do science. Look, here are all the classes, and these are my grades that show that I can do science, that I understand the science well. If you're essentially applying to be a researcher, well, I demonstrate to them that you have some experience doing research. Um, the, the written statements, that's where you can craft that story. So just really think of each of these, not as like a thing that you have to do, but like you only get so many arrows in your quiver to like convince them <laughs> That you're the best possible advocate. So, like, maximize how much you can use each of these things as a way to achieve that goal. All right. So, let's say you've written your application and uh, you get an interview. Um, what's the interview process like? Um, first thing to know is that um, the programs will pay for you to come visit, um, which is a great thing. Right? Sometimes you can go to a different part of the country you've never been before. Um, Somebody else's um, dime is always a good thing. Um, the structure of the interviews um, usually there'll be some kind of information session where you get kind of like nuts and bolts about the program. Um, a big part of it is um, one to one faculty interviews. So um, these will be like, you know, maybe a half hour long, uh, where it's just you and one of the faculties in, in that program uh, in their office usually talking about your research experience uh, and, and their research. Um, and an opportunity for you to ask questions about more about the program and that faculty's research interests, how they run their group, anything that you can think of. Um, 
oftentimes uh, you will be asked once you kind of get the offer to come interview, you'll be asked which faculty you know, you'd be interested in talking to, and if they're available, um, they'll, they'll try and set you up. So you do get some input in that, which is good. Um, and um, yeah, that's a really important part of uh, the process to give the faculty visiting department uh, you know, a strong impression that you're prepared to do research, that you're super interested in that program, uh, and, and you can be a candidate. Uh, and then, um, and then there's always opportunities to interact with the other grad students, which is which is equally as important. Um, they're probably often better people to ask questions to about you know what life in the department is like, what their research is like, um, and and usually that can be oriented around science. Some programs will have you meet one on one with grad students. Sometimes there'll be poster sessions where grad students are presenting on their science, or it could be like completely a social interaction, like you know, have lunch with a grad student, get a tour with a grad student, go out to the bar at night with a grad student. Um, there's uh, lots of opportunities usually to interact with the grad students. And um, and that's important and important to keep in mind you're still being interviewed in those interactions as well, because all the departments get feedback from the current grad students on the people that they've been talking to as well. Um, that's just sort of like general life tip rule of thumb. Anytime you interview, no matter who you interact with in that interview, um, always like remember that you're on an interview because um, oftentimes they give feedback um, no matter who it is that you're meeting with. Um, okay. Real quick. Yes. Um, if you're one of the, I just wanted to mention, if you're one of the, our students who maybe gets a little nervous talking to faculty, which is totally normal and reasonable, um, a great way to practice for these one-on-one -on -one faculty interviews and this interview process is to talk to faculty here, right? You're in courses with undergrad faculty who are likely also grad faculty or have labs, right? So getting practice talking about science, talking about grad school with faculty um, is helpful, right? So the first time you're talking to somebody about grad school, it's a faculty member isn't in your interview, right? So um, it's a great way to practice just getting comfortable talking to to faculty members who may be a little intimidating, for, especially if you don't know them. So just, just wanted to mention that. Start talking to your faculty sooner than later to get a little more comfortable, right? Yeah. Seth, Tim? Both totally approachable in my in my opinion, right? And I think we're making that relatively clear, hopefully, during this session. And so, you know, get that practice. Um, comfortability really helps um, when you're talking to to faculty members. Yeah, and completely related to that, right? That is like so. My first key to success is right? be able to communicate your research experience and purpose in those interactions. Um, and um, yeah, one thing that probably the best way to prepare especially like for the faculty interviews, is just be aware that usually the first question you get is something like, and these guys can speak to their experiences, like tell me about your research experience. That's the first question I always ask is, they'll sit down, we'll make some kind of small talk, and then I'll say, so you were here, like what was your research experience? And be prepared to answer that question with what people call like an elevator pitch, right? With like a planned kind of like few minute, three to five minute kind of um, summary of what you did. Um, and then the conversation will go from there, but but kind of having that ready to go and practice, making sure you kind of hit all the things that you want to emphasize and have a really nice description of the importance of what you did, significance, what your project was, you know, what your kind of key result was, um, whatever we go into that elevator pitch, um, that's a good, that's kind of the best way. Um, and then be engaged um, and ask questions. So like a common thing people ask me is like, do I need to read all the papers of the professors who I'm interviewing with? And my answer to that usually is, you know, you don't really have to, uh, it can't hurt to read a little something, but, um, but usually there's not that expectation that you would have done that. Oftentimes you'll read a paper and like the lab is like completely moved on from that anyway, so there's <laughs> not that much you could really, you know, talk about. Um, but really, this, the most important thing is just to be engaged, right? Listen to what people are saying, um, process it, and ask questions, right? Like show that you're just enthusiastic about science and what's going on uh, in those labs. Uh, yeah, and don't be shy to ask other questions about, you know, life-related things, you know, like quality of life, mentorship, what's the mentorship like, you know, what's the climate like in the department, all those things are also questions to ask. Um, Okay, so any questions about that? We'll come back to questions after. Yeah. Uh, okay, so then finally, um, before I turn it over, um, 
what um, are the things that you should consider when choosing a program? So either where do I apply or, or I've gotten into you know three places and um, I have to choose one. Um, what should you be thinking about? Um, probably what most people tell you is number one is does the research dim there accept you? Did you go to, on that interview day and when you look at the web pages of all the labs in that program, um, is that research that excites you and you're gonna wanna wake up every day and go to lab, right? That's that's kind of like the most important thing. Um, but often there's people like anything, I, I was that way, pretty much like anything would excite me and could see myself being happy um, doing any kind of um, project. So um, maybe that's not um, a big thing, but you definitely want to, to make sure that you're, you're excited by it. Um, the other thing to think about is culture and fit. Um, the impression that you get on the interview, remember I mentioned the interviews are definitely two way, like you're kind of, getting a feel for what the students are like in that program, what the faculty are like in that program. Does it feel like a culture um, where you can thrive uh, is, is a huge um, issue and really something I think you have to go and visit um, to get to get a sense of. Um, uh, one thing you might want to think about is um, flexibility uh, in the training. Um, you know, are there offering lots of classes that you're interested in, um, and and are there enough research laboratories um, where you can find something? Um, that's something to think about. Um, of course, like you want to think about life outside a lab. You're going to be at this place for five, six, maybe seven years. Is it a place that you want to live? Um, is it uh, is there enough support and program to allow you to live okay? Um, and um, yeah, where it is, that's definitely, of course, something um, that you, whoops, that you can, you can consider. Um, yeah, the stuff that you want to add to that, Tim? Um, in terms, one of the things that classes is up there is to realize that, like, when you are in your undergraduate program, there's, like, required classes that you have to take, and then there might be another session that talks more about grad school generally. Um, but just to say that, like, classes kind of work differently when you're in grad school. Like, for the most part, you're going to have a research program. There might be some core classes that you have to take. But it tends to be much more harder. Um, like, you only take the classes because you need the knowledge that's being taught in those classes to, to execute the research that you're, you're performing, um, which makes them a lot more fun because um, it tends to make it very, very practical and very, very tangible. Um, even if they're very abstract, it's still as practical in the sense that it's moving you towards um, the development goal. All right, let's turn it over then to our undergrads. <laughs> Do we have Sam, Irene, and Michaela? Do you maybe want to bring some seats and face the, face the audience here? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you. So, yeah, like if you can just take like a few minutes um, and maybe. Uh, wait, how do I, uh, do I exit so the rest of will be on the camera? I have them on the camera, I'm controlling it. Even though I'm sharing my screen. Yes, you can. Okay. You can stop. Should I stop share, sharing? Probably. Yeah. Oh. Um, oh, there. Hey, why are they not seeing the mouse over here? Well, if they can, if they can be seen. That's fine. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, Ashley, do you want to? Um, I can. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm Ashley. Um, and I'm going to be going to UC Davis in the fall. And I'm actually going to pursue a master's in forensic science. Um, definitely what they were talking about as far as like changing your like research pathway. Here I work in a lead lab and I do a lot of like electrochemistry and stuff. And that is completely different than what I will be doing. But um, yeah, I just over the past year, I have obviously I um, applied to a lot of like PhD programs and I just recognized that that wasn't for me and that doing research here wasn't for me. I didn't want to spend my life doing that and forensics is something that I was always really passionate about and that I kind of pursued and I also just kind of want to talk about like don't feel like if you're in my situation I kind of struggled a little bit with like feeling somewhat ashamed going after a master's instead of a PhD, but just don't feel that way, like, at all. Like, do whatever you want to do. It's your life. Like, pursue what you want to do. Um, 
Yeah, as far as like the application process goes, a couple of recommendations. Um, get your letters of rec early because professors love everybody wait until like the last day <laughs> to submit something. And I probably sent like, I don't know, like five emails to Sean McKinney the last day. I was like, hey, please. Um, but yeah, so that's a big one. And then also with all your statements, really just try to connect everything that you can back to why you're a great candidate as Tim was saying it's so important because if you just like ramble on nobody really cares so just kind of connect that back as best as you can so hi guys i'm michaela um i i will be going to university of oregon in the fall to get my phd um i'm just going to walk you through my whole thought process honestly so like during the summer this year I was kind of freaking out because I knew starting undergrad, I was like, okay, I want to go to grad school. It's going to be awesome. But then the summer before I was like, wait a minute, is this actually what I want to do? So I had a lot of conversations with Tim actually throughout the summer kind of being like, okay, I am, I just need to get my thoughts out. So I, during the summer was working full time, like at Starbucks. And I was having, and I was also doing research here still, but I was having a lot of problems with the fact that I wasn't feeling mentally stimulated. And that was making me feel like really super horrible. And so when I came into his office and I was like, hey, I don't know really if I should take a gap year or if I should go straight into the PhD. He said one of the biggest things that he gets because he's on the admissions committee and reads like the letters of, or the statements of purpose and everything is that people who take gap years and come back, they say that it's because a lot of the jobs that they were able to do with their bachelors weren't like mentally stimulating enough for them. Like they would just sit and like set set like running experiments all the time. And that was kind of one of the biggest things for me because I don't like super repetitive things over and over and over again. And there also wasn't even a guarantee that I would find a job right immediately after graduating with the bachelor's. So then I thought about it and I was like, okay, it would be awesome. So I wrote my personal statements. And then I think the biggest thing with that for me that I conveyed was just like, I really like chemistry, like a lot. And I wanted the people who was reading my uh, applications to understand that. And um, so I basically just kind of conveyed that debatably I put in, I, my personal statement was all one thing. So there weren't two things. And I applied to three schools only because I was kind of like, I would rather apply to fewer schools that I was actually interested in the research there than apply to a bunch of schools. Cause it's also expensive, like very expensive to apply to all these places. Like it's more than undergrad applications. I think each one was like 150 bucks. Um, so I, picked a few schools, submitted my statement of purpose, which basically I went into my strengths. I even went into my weaknesses, which was kind of like, well, I don't know if I want to do that. But um, if, as long as you can say like, hey, this is what I want to do to fix this. This is what I'm interested in. I'm going to make it happen. That's awesome. Um, and then letters of rec. That was a big thing too. So I had been emailing professors that I had been in classes with for like months, right? And I did not get emails back from a lot of the professors that I had good rapport with. And so that was horrible because then like the week before the applications were due, I was like, I'm still missing one letter of rec. So keep in mind, you can also get letters of rec from grad students that you work under in the lab, which I think is honestly kind of awesome because they know you better than even your PI does probably because you're spending all of this time designing the experiments with them. You're spending all of this time doing the experiments with them. They know how you work. So if they can give you a nice letter of rec, then that's cool. I mean, I think it is preferable to have like a professor, but um, yeah. And then the interview processes and stuff, it's not as scary as, I think it was more lax than I thought it was gonna be. Like I went in and I thought it was gonna be like super like, okay, hello, my name is Michaela Baca. Um, this is what I'm interested in. No, they were kind of just like, hey, how are you as a person? Like, what are you gonna bring to this? Like, are you excited to be here? What's your research experiences? 
And it was just, mine weren't even one-on-one. -on -one. I had like two other people in there with me. Um, so that also kind of made it better because all the attention wasn't on me. But yeah, I think that kind of sums it all up. Oh, oh, actually, I don't actually even want to go into research either. Like after my um, PhD, ideally I'd like an industry position. Um, and I think that I'm thinking of it as an investment for my future. And I don't think that you should go straight into it if you're burnt out either after undergrad, because that's going to suck, I think, after talking to all the grad students that I talked to, too. So, sorry, I kind of yapped, but that's all. No, thank you. Wait, Ari, before you go, I just I realized I forgot to say something really important was your comment about applications being expensive. One thing that we forgot to talk about was like um, cost of graduate school itself. Um, and, and it's a really important thing to know that uh, in the US, um, almost every PhD program in the sciences, um, you will get guaranteed funding for five years. Um, so you don't like, not, unlike medical school where you have to pay or take out lots of loans, PhD programs um, are, are funded. So you, you don't have, you get a, basically like a fellowship uh, what's equivalent to a fellowship to pay for tuition and fees, uh, and you get some kind of stipend for living expenses. And that's either funded, um, the, the two most common mechanisms would be either you're serving as a teaching assistant, which you bought at TAs, right? That's that's their TAing in order to get their grad school paid for, um, or um, what's called a graduate student researcher, um, where you're paid by uh, a faculty member's grant to, to, um, to work in the lab, and that also will cover tuition, your tuition fees. So um, if you're kind of having thoughts, um, I might be interested in grad school, but I don't know how I'm going to afford it. Um, that's one of the great things about PhD programs is they're completely free. Okay, sorry. And, sorry, one more. Um, for the applications, they, it can be expensive to apply, as Michaela mentioned. Um, it also, there are also often application waivers. Um, I The ones I've seen a lot of the time are like, if you apply by this certain deadline before the actual deadline, you can have a fee waiver. So keep your eyes open for that. And if it's a barrier for you that you can't apply to a program because you can't afford the application, reach out to that program and see what's available. Because it's possible that they just don't advertise it. Um, until like someone needs it, right, and reaches out. So you know, it's it's also could be something of like, oh, the student was interested in that, in us that they want to do this, even though it's a, a hardship for them. So um, just keep that in mind as well when you're applying. Thank you. Back to you. Back to you. <laughs> Hi, Marine. Hi. Uh, I was. My situation is a bit different than the other panelists here because. I graduated uh, from UCSC in 2022. And so what I did is I graduated with my bachelor's in biochemistry and molecular biology. And I thought that I wanted to go into industry. So I was in industry for a year and I had a great experience, but um, what I realized is that what has been said a few times that um, with a bachelor's degree, you're not going to be expected to, or even assigned to design your own experiments very much. Like at most, what I was doing was optimizing experiments and performing the same experiments over and over and, over and a whole ton of like pipetting and stuff, and Western blocks. Uh, so yeah, I wasn't sure at, before of, I went into industry, obviously, that I was even gonna go to grad school. And um, due to like unique situations with me, I eventually ended up uh, deciding that I wanted to leave industry and come back to grad school or back and get to uh, continue my education because I wanted, I didn't want to be more challenged and uh, I wanted to continue pursuing research because I did do uh, undergraduate research uh, while I was here uh, with Len Milhauser and I definitely enjoyed that experience and I wanted to continue doing that. And uh, right now I'm actually in a post uh, post back program, which is a post bachelor program um, here uh, called PrEP, uh, put together by STEM Diversity. So I'm getting paid to do research before I go to grad school. Um, so that's great. Um, and what else do I have to say about that? Yeah, there's nothing wrong with um, if you really like the faculty here. If you really like the science that's being done here, to continue uh, 
and go to grad school at the same institution you did your undergrad in. There's nothing wrong with that. And, uh, as my situation shows, there's not necessarily anything wrong with taking a, a break or a gap year um, between your bachelor's and your um, going to grad school. Um, especially, I think in my situation, I was sh still showing that I was practicing scientific, um, I was learning new tools and I was still in that realm of doing science. So I could still sell those skills and uh, say that, hey, I'm able to do research. But, yeah. Um, and uh, like you said, um, interviews, uh, for the most part, I I only um, applied here, which I would not recommend. I wouldn't. I would recommend applying to multiple schools because you're not sure if you can get it. But um, the interview process was not as stressful as I imagined. It was definitely more casual than I thought it was going to be. Um, but I definitely did prepare by knowing the questions I wanted to ask, and I did go over the research that um, the faculty I was interviewing with do so that I could ask you know good questions and be able to engage with what they were talking about. Um, and yeah, uh, it was kind of described as like a vibe check. They were giving me a vibe check uh, effectively, like saying like, do we really want this person here? We know about what you can do based on your, uh, your application. So go into the interview knowing that this, uh, the person that's interviewing you already knows what you said in your application. So add more, put, like add more to it and support your application. Um, give them more information that they may not already know. But yeah, it's a two-way street. Um, it's definitely an opportunity for you to figure out if it's a good fit for you and not just for them to see if you're a good fit for the program. Uh, I'm Sam. I'm, um going to Caltech for a PhD in chemistry this upcoming fall. Um, some advice that I would give for applying and like my process was don't wait till the last minute. Um, I applied to eight schools in the last four days. Terrible mistake. I slept four hours each day uh, and then have no idea how to manage to get it done. I uh, lived off of nothing but energy drinks and um, Random food. Um, don't do that. Uh, I did what I did do is I asked for letters right early. That's one of the first things I did. Uh, but like my writing process was uh, I would like talk to, I started like almost rambling because like if I wrote, wrote, wrote down the word limit, I want to go above that word limit and then just like cut it down. Okay, so I just rambled my stories. I and mean, rambling's not good. But you from there, you could like cut out parts. And then I talked to like my friends and my family about the aspects that they think I should include. Because a lot of times when you're writing these things, and this is my experience, is you just sort of like subconsciously omit stuff that you don't even think of. But the people around you who know you will be like, why didn't you include this? You should include that. Um, and I found that to be super helpful. And like applications are really expensive. Um, I think eight schools, it was like a thousand dollars. I don't have a thousand dollars, but what I did have is a bunch of waivers. So I got a bunch of waivers either through the STEM diversity program that I'm a part of, but also most of my waivers came from conferences that I traveled. So if you've done undergraduate research, you should apply to scientific conferences that are like undergraduate aimed. Um, and there you can meet schools and get free waivers and hold on to those. That way when you apply, it doesn't cost me. So I think at the end, I only ended up paying out of pocket like $100 because I forgot what school it was. They just were like, oh, we don't accept this. I was like, okay, well, I don't really, I'm going to apply, but I don't think I'm going to go to you because um, you weren't accommodating. Um, another thing I would say like about interviews is the interview process, like some of mine were really relaxed. The Caltech one was extremely stressful. It was... 10 questions in 10 minutes on a 15 minute Zoom interview. Really stressful with two people, two professors who were asking me questions back and forth. And that was sort of just, they wanted to know like 
about you, but also want to know, like, make sure that you knew what you're doing. So I think like a key thing to take out of your undergraduate research is like when you leave your undergraduate research, you want to be like, you want to know your research front to back. Um, if anyone asks you a question, you can sort of answer, but not like it, obviously not a PhD level because that takes years of experience. Um, and even that is something they look like take into consideration. Um, I think another thing that I also found is important is because like, if you get a bad grade in a class or something, it doesn't mean it's the end of the world. You can still apply. Um, and you, you might be surprised. And then don't feel limited on schools you can apply to. Like if there's a school that seems really cool and you don't really feel like you're gonna get in, you can still apply to it. You never know. Like I applied to Caltech on a whim and I got in. I was shocked. Um and then Trying to think of any other advice. Uh, keep a good CV. If any of you have started writing CVs, that's one of the best ways to keep track of like if you're going to write a, not a, a statement of purpose where you can talk about all of your experiences, because it can be very easy to like lose track of what you did. And then keeping like good organization skills, of presentations, work I've done, etc. Anything that can be related into your essay, and then. Like personal statements, like I talked a lot about uh, like personal struggles that I faced throughout life in my undergraduate career and shaping those in a way is where you like you overcame this and this is how it strengthened me as a person is a really good thing to include because it shows a lot about like your character and that you're willing to work because a PhD is going to be inherently difficult and through your personal statement that if you can demonstrate that you can overcome challenges, that's something I think that uh, departments really like there. Are, I have heard some departments don't like that. My personal opinion is don't go to a school that doesn't like people who fix challenges and gotten over them. Um, uh, I think that's mostly it. Thanks, guys, for sharing. That's great. Um, so we have, yeah, we have plenty of time to just open it up for questions. Yeah. Um, how, you know, like, how much you need to know about what specific research you want to do, like in like a contract school and like your first like universe style, I guess. Um, like how long it takes to figure out what research you're gonna do. Yeah, so the, the process is um in the fields most related to chemistry and biochemistry, um, the process is usually you uh, apply to a department or kind of program that's a group of faculty, um, get there, and then some time during the first year is when you choose a lab. And that process varies a little bit more. Some programs, you just basically start going to some lab meetings and especially traditional chemistry programs are like this. You just sort of like sometime in like winter, spring, you talk to a lot of people, go to lab meetings, pick a lab. Uh, more biology focused um, programs uh, have to rotate, do what are called rotations where you actually have like, you know, 10 week periods uh, in a few different labs. And then at the end of that process, we'll pick one. So usually in um, fields closest to chemistry and biochemistry, uh, you you don't make that decision before you apply. There's some, like other STEM fields, like um, like uh, especially like geology or even like uh, often like ontology, evolutionary biology. Those programs you like write to the professor and you say, "I want to do research in your lab for my PhD." So, um, but yeah, usually you have some time to figure that out. Um, in terms of like the application process. And we talked about this a little, like in, in the statement of purpose, you definitely want to put something about um, what your research interests are. Um, and that's usually going to be rooted in the research experience that you've had. It could be different, but like through classes in your research experience, that's how kind of you learn about what, what you're interested in. And, and it doesn't have to be very specific. Um, sometimes if it's too specific, like Tim pointed out, it could actually like backfire because if you're interested in this very narrow thing, it might not be a good fit for that program. Um, usually what I tell people is, is like, 
and, and and it's okay to honestly not know what you want to do, you know, in a chemistry program, let's say, what, you know, whether you do synthetic chemistry or um, chemical biology or, you know, presumably, or, or even like me, like I, I was like somewhere between physical chemistry and biochemistry, which are like totally different. I still didn't even know at the time I was applying. So I, I think it's okay to not know, but you'd want to say in the statement of purpose, like, here are some things that I find interesting I can see myself doing. Because when you get applications, I don't know what your experience is, but when I get applications where people like just seem like they don't know at all, it just it, it comes across as not having thought deeply enough about your future and what you want to do. Yeah, exactly. Um, I was going to sort of build off that. Like in the statement of purpose uh, for most of my applications, I think the last paragraph is when I talked about faculty as you should work with. Work with. So I talked about like three faculty. I gave like one to two sentences on each, like, I want to work with this person for X, Y, and Z reasons, but then I make sure to connect it back to the previous paragraphs where I talk about my research experience as a way to like demonstrate that like, oh, because I have like reminding the reader, because they're reading hundreds of applications, like I've had this experience, research experience, and this is how it is related to working with this faculty and I'm a good fit. Um, yeah. I also think that when when you're choosing a program, like for me, it was important that there was a lot of variety in the research areas that there were. Because like right now, I'd say, I guess it's kind of like physical organic research that I'm doing, sort of. Um, and there's a lab at my like at University of Oregon that I is like super closely aligned with my research now. Um, but it's also important to me because I mean, I don't really know what kind of research that I want to ultimately do for the next five years. You know what I mean? And I get rotations. So I have to do 10 week periods through three labs. And then if I don't like any of those three labs, I can do a fourth rotation, but then I'm expected to join that fourth lab. So for me, I was really looking for something that there were different areas of chemistry. Because a lot of schools that I was looking at before the applications were like very organic chemistry heavy and I don't really like organic chemistry like at all and so um at my school there's a lot of physical chemistry there's a lot of materials chemistry but there's also um there's also more physical organic there's also more materials whatever organic synthesis based labs there's a lot of those um and something that we don't do a lot of here is catalysis and I was super interested in that and so there's also options to explore things that I've never even done before. Um, so it's okay. I even wrote that in my personal statement. I was like, I don't know what research that I want to go into. However, this is what I'm going to do to narrow it down. I'm going to talk to these professors. I'm going to see, okay, this is what I like. This is what I don't like. You just have to make sure that you have a plan going into it. Like, okay, yeah, I don't know what I want to do, but this is the steps I'm going to lay out to get to an ultimate goal of whatever. So, yeah. On that one thing I'll just weigh in with is uh, that like when you're crafting that statement and tying things together, like just be authentic. Um, so like don't like have like exactly what like has been said, having like a structured plan, like, yeah, that, that looks good. That looks well put together, but like don't BS something like we, it is actually pretty easy to pick up on that. Um, and you'll just do a better job writing something if it's if it's authentic. If you feel like you're at a position where it's like you have absolutely no idea what's going on, then maybe you want to talk to somebody and we can help craft that into something that's a little bit more directed and yet is still kind of like true to your, your experience. And one other quick thing that I'll say, if you're interested in uh, studying abroad for your PhD, your PhD is probably one of the most transferable degrees that there is in the world. Um, most countries in the world have PhD programs and they recognize as such. Um, they, it can work quite differently. Um, so just make sure that you do your homework um, for, uh, because like Seth was saying, like some of the other models where you do a plan directly to a lab instead of to a program, um, for instance. So, so you just want to make sure that you do your homework in advance. So. Um, another thing I was going to say that I should have mentioned earlier is a sort of build off of like being, it, I was nervous to talk to faculty and like talking about your research, if you make a mistake when talking about your research with them, like make sure to, you could like sort of either acknowledge it or if they notice it, just like, oh, my mistake, and they put it in there. 
don't feel like, oh, I made a mistake. That means I don't know anything. We all make mistakes. Um, and just acknowledging that we're all human. We make mistakes is a good way to like get through interviews if they get stressful. So what is the like grading of us in that school as a reading progress wise like what's it looks like? Um there yeah, there are grades in classes, although some it varies by program program. Some programs will let you just do pass no pass. Um, so classes, I guess, I mean, the framework is pretty much the same as during um, your undergrad. Once you kind of finish classes and move on into the part where basically you're just re doing research, um, different programs kind of have different sort of hoops that you have to jump through and benchmarks um, where you're kind of making steady progress. Um, uh, probably the most common thing is that there is at some point some what's called the qualifying exam where you um, qualify to get a PhD. Um, usually it's like in your second to third year. Um, and usually it consists of some kind of like written part and an oral exam. Um, that's kind of the, the biggest hoop that you jump through. Um, but otherwise, um, you know, you're I mean, technically like here, we do give grades for working in lab. It's usually pass, no pass. And um, usually unless like there's some huge problem, people, so grades definitely sort of become, I think we talked about this a little, they've definitely become de-emphasized for sure. And it's more about um, the, the, the quality of the dissertation in the end and publishing papers along the way. The currency instead of like grades kind of becomes publishing papers in terms of like how you'd be evaluated after that. So if you apply to a program and you like get in and then you end up not wanting to be part of that program, like what's the process? Like, are you stuck with that or can you like switch? So you mean you decide to go and then yeah. you're not happy? You're not, like you're not happy. Like you spent like some time in the program and you're just not happy with it. It's rare. Well, <laughs> so the, so in terms of the switching, cause it, like, let's say like you applied to like five schools and you got into four of them and then you accept admissions into one. Like you can't then like switch to one of the other ones. Like the idea is you've been admitted into their program, you'd probably have to like formally leave that program and then reapply yeah. apply to the other. Kind of like college. If you're just yeah. college, yeah, yeah, yeah. after first year of college. But if within a program, if you join a lab and then things aren't going well in that lab, there could be a greater opportunity for like horizontal motion in that program. Um, that gets handled that very differently at all different types of institutions, but. Um, generally, most farmers like want you to be successful, and so if it's clear that you continue in a lab, it's like not good for you and it's not good for the lab. Like, yeah, we we find a way to change things so that it is good for you and that it is good for the lab. Does that make sense? Yeah. Also, if you're like unhappy um, after like the first two years, like right around the times of like your qualifying exams or whatever, and you are like, yeah, this is not for me. I do not want to continue with the research. You can leave with a master's. So most programs are. But what's the difference between a master's and a PhD? Like, what are the differences of what you get out of these programs? In terms of what you do in the program, or in terms of what you do with that degree. Um, in terms of what you do with the degree. Um, I would still say most of the time a master's is going to be more like a bachelor's in, in, in terms of doing research in industry. It's still you're not going to be the one kind of designing experiments. Uh, uh, usually it's similar to you're going to have similar work kind of type, but maybe get paid a little bit more. Some companies will pay a little bit more for a master's. Um, so I, I usually caution people against going for a master's if the goal is to like use that to get an industry job with maybe some exceptions. Um, it's a good thing to do. Often there are certain teaching jobs where uh, they want you to have a master's. That's so for teaching that can make a huge difference and be a reason to do it. Um, as a stepping stone toward the PhD, um, not all the time, but there's definitely certain people scenarios um, where it can help a lot. Um, we definitely get people who uh, have done masters at um, like a lot of CSUs have masters programs um, that are great 
Um, I just very quickly, it would be the kind of thing I would recommend um, for people who haven't had a chance to do research. Um, it's a good way to get research experience because almost all master's programs, uh, like at Cal State, you'll, you'll get some more research experience. Um, it's also potentially a path if your grades are not so good. Um, sometimes it can help to go get a master's first and show that you can do the work. Um, but generally speaking, if you've done well, you have research experience, and ultimately you want that type of job where you're the driving the science, a master's isn't going to do much for Sorry, like something like what Ashley's doing, totally different because forensic science is, um, it's, yeah, it's unique. Well, yeah, like specialized, specialized training. Yeah, specialized like training. If there's a degree, yeah. if there's an area that requires specialized training, then that's often where it's sort of forensics. Like that can be where the uh, master's degree provides with the extra year to, to get your, like, learn your fundamentals during the bachelor's degree. And then though that program gives you that specialized training that you need to be able to function to do that. Yeah, what I was just saying was I was thinking like masters in chemistry or masters in biology. Yeah. That's kind of like oftentimes for friends. Oh, there are PhD programs. There are a few PhD programs in forensics around the country, but oftentimes the masters in a specialized field like that is the terminal degree. Yeah. And like, what would be the difference? Like, on like what you do during the program? Right. So. Uh, Master's programs can vary. Some are completely coursework based. That would be like somebody who's going there for teaching. We used to have one like that, actually. Um, I would say most in kind of chemistry related fields are um, research based masters. They're usually, I would say, two years. You take courses and you do kind of like a research project. It's a little bit scaled down from a PhD project. Uh, and um, yeah, I don't know what else about. The one thing that I would say is, um, so it was brought up previously, the idea that, you know, if it's really not a good fit and you typically it's after you go like past your qualifying exam um, in a PhD program, that would have been the same requirements had there been a master's program. So the idea is that you can get a master's degree. You'll sometimes hear this being referred to as mastering out as a pejorative term, and that's bullshit. Nobody should ever call it that. Um, it is a lot of hard work to do that. That is something that that person should be proud of achieving. Um, and so, Awesome. Most master's programs you have to pay for, unlike PhD programs. So that can be offset by um, TA. So it's like not going to pay for anything, like no financial aid for master's program? Uh, yeah, usually. I mean, it's. Yeah, I don't know how like need based financial aid works for master's programs, but. Uh, it's not like you get the tuition remission like, like when you go to the PhD program. So you have to pay for it somehow. But I think TAs are usually available and I can offset it. Yeah. I think also if you go into industry after your bachelor's, the um, company can also pay for your master's later. Yeah, that, that could happen, I think. I don't know. Yeah. I think it's tough to find those opportunities and know it will happen beforehand. Yeah. yeah. But when you're interviewing for a company job, that might something you can find out. Yeah. Uh, for the interview, would you suggest reaching out to the professors beforehand, or would you want to report it to the Um, You can. I don't think it's necessary. There's certainly not the expectation that you would. Um, probably many of them are not going to respond. Like, <laughs> like we've heard professors do. Um, some of them might say, looking forward to meeting you. Uh, I guess it can't hurt. I don't know if I have. Well, I have to say, like, what did you post? Yeah. I didn't reach out. However, I did. I did. I didn't read any full papers, not one. I read the abstracts of maybe, maybe the most recently published one. Honestly, I think it's enough to just go onto the faculty website and look at the research tab and see what they're doing. Um, because that gives you enough questions. I know a lot of people went through and read entire papers and then they went to the interviews and we all came out and they were like, what the hell, man? I wasted however many hours. Because reading papers, it's a lot of work mentally, okay? And it takes a really long time to gain anything from reading those papers. If you actually want to comprehend it, you don't need to do that. And I honestly don't think you need to reach out to the faculty either. I think you're going to get your opportunity to speak to them. Um, unless you're like, 
super mega, super interested in their lab, and you're like, I need, I need to kind of kiss ass a little bit, then sure, if you want, but uh, maybe better to reach out after and like, like yeah, thank you, oh, thank you nude, and I enjoyed talking to you. Bye. Email. A few professors, but those are the only ones that I was like super interested in meeting with. And I think like half of them didn't respond. Um, <laughs> uh, and then I only like read abstracts of, I think it, for labs, I like my top like three choice labs, I read like one paper. Um, that's because like they asked it, I just want to be like, I was a little paranoid. I was like, I want to make sure I'm like super prepared. It was kind of, it was pointless. But, um, just like skimming abstracts or even reading their website is like, I think, good enough. So we should, um, it's 105, so let people go want to go, but we can um, stick around. Tim and I, you can always find, we're always around on this hallway. But, yeah, thanks for coming. Thanks, everybody.